Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for our Lunch and Learn Archive Encounters, Stories Told by the Artist Archivist. Peter Morphew is a professional archivist and artist, having obtained an Archivist Masters of Science from the University of Glasgow in Scottsdale. Peter has spent the last eight years working within Scottish and English business, theater, university, and governmental archive bodies. Throughout this time, he has been recording his experience within the archive through his creative practice. Peter is currently an archivist based at Berea, Berea College in Kentucky and is also a digital artist in residence with the James Ford Bell Library at the University of Minnesota. Just a few notes before we begin today. Um, today's session will be recorded and Peter will be taking questions at the end of his talk. Um, and I'll help facilitate the Q&A at the end. So if you have questions, um, hold them till the end and we would love to hear from you. And now I will turn it over to Peter. All right, thank you very much. So the first thing I've got to do, I've got to actually check to see that you can actually uh, see my screen. Right. It's taken a while. Okay, can everyone see this? Anyone? We can't right, I think you're more. nodding. Yeah, you are. Good. Grand. Right, let's get started then. So the first thing I should uh, warn everyone is that I'm a very messy presenter. I do all of my presentations with no notes. Um, the visual images that I have on my slides, they represent my notes. So it's going to be messy and all over the place. What I am hoping for today is that you can get some insight into what it is that happens when an artist uses archival materials. So, I mean, our profession is incredibly good at handling researchers who are churning out journal articles and written publications, but we don't always have conducive access points for creative practitioners and artists. And I guess my work, a lot of it is about how can we enable access to retained heritage collections? So, well, I suppose the first thing I should really talk about is, is a bit about myself. So I've got an archives and records management master's from the University of Glasgow. And predominantly my experience has been in Britain. So I've been working for the University of Glasgow, University of Gloucestershire, and I'm now here at Berea Ar College Archives in Kentucky. So basically, when I started, I really started to ask a question of, is the archive art? I want you to just take a moment and just think about what an archive is to you. An archive is a collection of retained information, of retained heritage. But is it art? I mean, when you think about the theatre, you go along to the theatre, you, you walk in, you get your ticket, and you sit down. There's a stage. It's a house or a theater, just like when you go off to a, a, a pizza restaurant. You're expecting to get a pizza at the pizza restaurant, just like with art. If you go to an art gallery, you're expecting to see art. You expect to have an art experience within the art gallery. So asking the question is, art? Can art exist within an archive? It's a disruptive question. Of course, now my questions really also ask is, uh, my work is very boring. It's quite disconnected. Why is that? And I'm really hoping you as an audience can help answer one of my big questions of where do I take artist archivists? Is it a PhD project? Is it wanting more exhibitions? So it's, let's give you some background. I have got a fine arts degree. Um, I did some fine arts before I became an archivist. And I was making very nice 
meaningless stuff. Like these, for instance, one of the highest compliments I got with my collages is when audiences came up to me and they were insistent I tell them what computer program I use to make my collages. And I always had to explain that all of my work is paper-based. Now, you, you will see how I use a computer a wee bit later, but predominantly I use paper. I use physical objects to create art. So what you see here are collages which are made out of paper. I've been playing with the shape, with the composition. And I love the fact that you can tell a story with the image and you can change the information. It, it means something so different from its original source, but it's really boring stuff in my mind because it, essentially what I was doing is image making. And how can it be exciting compared to archives? In my first job as an archivist, as a professional archivist, I worked for University of Glasgow Scottish Business Archive, and I was set a task of accessioning 68 banker boxes worth of material into the James Finlay archive. Now, to give you some context, Finlay's, that's what the company is now known as, it had to be, the company had been depositing records with the Scottish Business Archive since the 1970s. It was already a substantial collection. It could fill up a London bus quite easily. That's how much material was within this archive. So what I had to do was either integrate the records into the existing catalog and find a natural placement for these records, or I had to create entirely new funds level to describe the hundreds of subsidiary companies that the company owned. So here's a bit about the company history. The company founded around about 1750, and they actually founded themselves as a cotton merchant. Now, there was a cotton industry that were thriving in Britain during the 1750, but the company had to pivot uh, around about the 1860 with the outbreak of the American Civil War. They themselves, along with every other European cotton industry, were very much impacted by the union's blockade of the confederacy so what the company did is that they started to grow tea and they are still growing tea today they are an international tea merchant and a real significant scottish business so essentially i was shifting through all of these records and i was building this really complex relationship with the information i was finding minute volumes photographic prints I was finding records to do with land ownership in India. I was finding the most incredible telegrams, which is really documenting how the company was trying to get its workers out of Bangladesh when the Bangladesh Civil War was occurring. There was so much material, and I was aghast at how interesting this archive was. It was, it was extraordinary. And when you compare it to my artwork, of just image making, you can see why I love being an archivist. There are so many stories to have. There are so many encounters that we as archivist professionals have. I mean, if you look at this, th these are just some of the records that I was encountering. Photographic prints from Southeast Asia, circa 1910 uh, up to present day. I had packaging, this is tea packaging. On the whole, the actual company was growing the tea. So they were growing and trading the tea plant rather than actually trading in the product. But they did have some products under development as well, which was within the archive. And so this is when I started Artist Archivist. Now, you remember what I was saying about how there was so much information within this collection, that there is a rich diversity of stories of, of record types. Well, I didn't really get time to see any of it. So this was like the first collage I made as artist archivist. It's actually just to represent how I felt more like I was working at a grocery store and just simply clicking the barcodes and all the products and putting them into bags. 
I felt like I was really quickly summarizing huge swathes of records. Like it's a minute volume, the years 1900 to 1901. That's it. Slap it in a box, put a unique identifier on. But I was really starting to realize what it meant to be an archivist. You see, now most people who are not archivists, right, you walk around the repository and you'll see countless shelves and boxes and tons of material and it, it's an amazing experience to actually see an archive repository but us archivists when we look at a box when we see the labels on the boxes we don't see that we see what's within each and every box you see here i actually know what's in each and every one i know all the volumes i know all the records i can remember everything visually so I decided to collage this elephant into the scene because there are so many photographic prints of elephants. And I'll explain a bit why later, why elephants are so important within this collection. But I just started to ask that question, how do I make artwork as an archivist? Now I had to sort of go back to 2014. Now I saw Henry Matisse's exhibition at the Tate Modern in London. Now, this was an extraordinary exhibition, and I love Matisse's work. He uses these decorative styles, flattened colors. Now, the compositions themselves are incredibly simple, and yet they're poetic. There is a sense of movement in there. Even though they're a simplistic form, you as an audience member, you can identify at least what it is, and you can have an experience with this artwork. And I was so taken aback by this exhibition that I thought, you know what, I, I'm going to try and replicate this technique. And it's a lot harder than it looks. So I tried to sort of visualize that moment that you have as an archivist when you're not getting a chance to really see the information. I saw this wonderful photographic print. They're posed, the tea pluckers on this bridge. And I started to craft what I thought I saw. So I used the paper, I weaved the paper in and out with one another, I stuck it all down. And it took weeks to get this one composition in a state of where I felt like it was right. And it, it was an incredible moment for me personally, because I, I just loved the activity of this image. It just looked so beautiful. And I decided to get one of the elephants. And this is my favorite photograph of Dr. Bjork in 1944. Now, he used an elephant to go traveling around the tea estates, because when we think of America, we think of Europe, today's standards, you've got roads everywhere, you've got infrastructure. You've got to bear in mind that when companies were going out to Southeast Asia, there was no infrastructure during the earlier parts of the 20th century. So tea estates actually needed to use elephants, and it also helped that it was the only way that you could sort of protect yourselves from a tiger attack as well. But elephants are also used on tea estates even today to help farm and maintain the actual estate, the crop. So I made this collage, but very quickly I was replicating this same technique and I was getting very bored, frustrated as well. It, it wasn't really saying what I wanted it to say. I mean, this is me trying to replicate that experience of opening up a box and just seeing what records are there on the surface level. But it, it wasn't, it, I felt like I was making images. I felt like I was not saying anything with my work. It's incredibly boring. As I said at the beginning of the presentation, why is my work so boring? And uh, I, I changed the materials. I started to do these oil pastels drawings of the actual repository space. I even curated some of the drawings so they actually sink inside of a repository. So it looks like it should and should not be there at the same time. But, but again, this boredom still persisted with my work. I was trying to describe how colorful the archive is. It may be for browns and deep reds, but actually to me, when I look around, I see lots of colors, lots of stories. And how can I, how can I be exciting within an archive because it's so complex? What you see here is not a blueprint. You see here is one of hundreds and hundreds of blueprints that are held within the James Finley archive. 
Now, what they're doing is that they're describing the products, uh, the architecture that exported from Scotland to their T estates in Southeast Asia. So we have plans for the construction of T worker housing, sleeping quarters, different plans for factories, and all of these different architectural plans. And they also took all of the uh, industry, the materials with them to Scotland out into Southeast Asia. So it was an example of how the actual British, um, how companies, no different from any other European company, was taking advantage of the access they had to their empires, to their overseas colonies, and imposing economics on different areas of the world. I mean, this also is archive is extraordinary because it's a vital resource for family historians. There are volumes and volumes of records which document the tea managers and the tea estate workers who migrated from the United Kingdom with Finleys into the tea estates. Not only do we have like dates of when they migrated, but also performance reviews. And they also brought along their social structures. You know, here's uh, the high end club in around about circa 1910 that it was founded. You can see that the dress, the societal structures are being imposed upon another area of the world. You know, we are persistently got problems in today's society as a direct result of European imperialism, of the empire building. And we got evidence of this within this archive. So it's no wonder I was getting bored and frustrated with my artwork, because how on earth can I even begin to tackle topics this big? So this is a bit of a surprise. Um, how on earth did we end up getting to the Scottish theatre archive? Well, this is the most important archive as an artist and as an archivist that I worked with. Again, part of the Scottish theatre archive, this is um, at the University of Glasgow, I was assigned a task of cataloguing the Adrian Howells archive. He died in 2014, and he was an internationally well-known one-to-one performance artist. So, you know, again, going back to what I said earlier about the theatre, if you think about the theatre, you've got 500 seats, you've got a stage, you go along, you watch the performance, and then you leave kind of thing. Adrian Howells was more than that. He believed in the intimacy of just having one audience member and him, the artist, the performer, the person who is hosting the event. What you see here on the left is his female persona, Adrian, who is performing Salon Adrian. What's important about this artwork is that it's taking place at a barber's. So he's actually washing people's hair. He's, cut, he's taken part of that process of like maintaining people's hairstyles because he's trying to get intimate conversations happening. He's trying to have an experience with his audience. He found theater, that the idea of just having a stage and seats to be so impersonal that he wanted something so much more in depth. He did multiple interpretations of an audience of Adrian, including uh, dirty laundry. People would bring along their dirty laundry and he would wash it. Again, it was one-to-one, -one. it was a private environment, you could book an appointment and you would witness the performance. But also the performance was audience-led. How they reacted to the piece and how they interacted with Adrian Howes was actually fundamental in delivering what it is that came out of it. And this is foot washing for the soul. Now you would think to yourself, oh, it's just performance art, somebody's having a great time, et cetera, watching people's feet, great. But actually, no, this is rigorous, methodical research that has gone behind this work. On the left is a folder, and that folder contains just some of the many bits of research that he did to do with foot washing all around the world. What did it mean culturally, internationally? What was the history behind it internationally? He was a scholar, and when you came along to have your feet washed, it was such methodical performance art. He would close the door on the actual performance, so the documentation doesn't actually exist of the artwork. The whole point is, is that the artwork exists in the moment. So all we're left with is the provenance in the archive collection. We know something happened. We also know something was being planned and prepared for. 
we've got festival programs which are telling us this is when the event's going to occur. So we've got all the information about this art, but we don't actually have the quote unquote art, which leads me back straight back to that question I was asking at the very start, can an archive be art? And this is when I really started to say, well, yes, it can be. So I tried to replicate the Adrian Howes experience. I got invited along to an archives records management conference and I exhibited my work. I brought along lots and lots of items that I'd been working on for the past two odd years and I was laying it all out and it didn't work at all. It, it really didn't work. And I, I will go into details as to why it didn't work later, if I remember. But what you see here as well, it, this is one of the big murals. You remember the oil pastel drawings that I did? Well, I did a huge mural of the actual repository space. I drew it intricately all the corners, all the boxes, and it's really visually interesting, but it's also an incredibly boring art piece. I, I just didn't feel like it was a success. And I really had to go back and really reassess what it was that I was doing wrong. So I changed my approach entirely. I really started to analyze what is the archivist's relationship with information. So stop looking at the space, ask what is that process that we archivists are involved in. Now this collage is basically how it feels to be an archivist. Now it looks crazy. You got this landscape all around, you're sitting with piles and piles of records, but actually an archivist is always assessing the informational and evidential value of records, of the information they contain. We're doing appraisal, we're actually asking, is this information adding value to a collection, or is it something that can be weeded out and disposed? It looks crazy, but us archivists are very organized. It all exists within our mind. We just, we can structure things really well. And to me, although it's just a scene that looks really chaotic, it's actually quite peaceful. And it's very much, it's a very relaxing environment. And I had to go all the way back to this one artwork, which I've never quite lost. The reason that I was a bit more successful with this piece than say all the other ones was because I really started to look at the authentic relationship with information. Picasso's Guernica. Now he wasn't actually in the Spanish Civil War. He wasn't there to witness the massacre at Guernica. He witnessed the press, the coverage, the information the documentation of a massacre occurring, and he was moved by it. And this was a commissioned piece. So what he did was he used the reportage to start constructing this masterpiece, this painting. And he also references the information by only using black, white, and gray. And that really goes straight back to the newspaper. That's what a newspaper looks like. There's no color, it's all reportage. And it's an authentic relationship with information rather than an authentic relationship with the actual event which he was not there to witness. So again, I started to really play more with that concept, the idea of information can be manipulated. An audience member might look at this painting that I produced and say, oh, okay, it relates to the anchor line. It's a picture of a ship. But actually, when you start scratching the surface, this is the first time that I started to really visually represent those themes that I saw in that blueprint. I used material from other sources, magazines, newspapers, all of which were pertaining to cultures internationally within Africa, within Southeast Asia. And I imposed my own visual image with that information. So I've actually done the same process as imperialism, except I'm recreating it with paper. So I'm changing the information. I'm changing how the information's perceived. And, and that was a big moment for me because I started to really understand that in my work as an artist archivist, there is a really strong relationship with the information as well as the archive, as well as the records.
which brings me, of course, naturally to Utah State Archive. The, the reason I started, well, to, to backtrack a bit, I first connected with Utah State Archive because of their social media presence. Now, the actual archive, it's so good with its outreach, the way it has a digital presence. It's incredibly energetic, it's engaging, and I wanted to do something to do with the archive. So I emailed them and they emailed me back and said, well, when you draw these, you know, Salt Lake City firefighters? And I was like, okay then. Originally I was gonna collage them, but the more I looked at it, I'm always like, I just want to draw it. And I realized that around about this time, I'd started to look at uh, German expressionism and I wanted to have more expression within my work. So instead of just replicating what I saw, I tried to create a very expressioned image. I wanted to create depth. I wanted to create soul within these drawings. I ended up producing something which I, I didn't even realize I could do this with oil pastel, that I was capable of it. I mean, this mustache, it was irresistible when I was doing the mark making. And I was so patient and methodical. And I also used the background of the paper to sort of bring the image out. I was, it was such an exciting thing that I was doing. And this is the power that archives have for artists because the, this, just connection that I had with Utah, it really changed the way I started to draw. I'm often going out and I'm drawing and sketching lots and lots of things, but it never occurred to me to actually start taking the sketches and apply the same mark making processes that I'd been doing just then. So that's what I started to do. I started to change the way I drew. I started to like really play around, explore what it meant to be, you know, oh yeah, sorry, yeah, COVID, right. So I was about to describe an entire new project for you, this sort of residency idea, how I was gonna use archives, but then COVID happened, we were all in lockdown and I was physically isolated from the University of Gloucestershire Archive, where at this point I was working. So it's a total disaster, but you know, I had to pivot. So again, this is the power of which archives has for artists. I collaborated with the Hardwick Gallery in my role as archivist for the University of Gloucestershire. So what we did, we created a digital artist in residence. Now, Louise accessed the archive digitally. And so she started producing blogs about the experience. She was documenting what she did, our conversations. She was also really just uh, exploring the collections that I made accessible. And here's an absolute legacy of work that's now available online via the Hardwick Gallery for you to view. And I started to do these drawings. I, I was only an archivist in this role. I was not an artist. And I got really excited about these little doodles that I was doing. This is to describe that process. You know how in records management books and like theories, you get all these process oriented grids and arrows. It's all you know, in the archivist field, everything has a process and a purpose, and there's a there's an objective to be had. I started to bring that into my doodles. I was selecting works based upon the artist's brief. I was photographing thousands upon thousands of items, which I thought would match the brief, making it accessible to Louise, who then blogged about it, who then started to cut the data. And I realized that whilst on the one hand, researchers didn't understand why is not everything in your archive available online? And I had to explain, well, I've got millions of records and I've got one archivist, I can't photograph everything. Um, but then having access to an artist allowed me to actually create unique data value. And the whole purpose of an archivist and maybe even artists, it's, to, it's a duty to document. And I was documenting what it was to be in an England lockdown during COVID. And the legacy that we have is this collaborative project at the Hardwick Gallery. And so this just really, really excited me. So I thought, you know, let's do what Louise did. Let's be a digital artist in residency at the James Ford Bell Library, University of Minnesota. I thought, yeah, let's do it. It's going to be easy. Louise did it. Oh, you can do it. And so, you know, 
it actually proved to be really, really complicated. The actual image you see here is one of many thousands of images that have been digitalized per available online. And they show European perspectives, uh, maps of the oceans, maps of like new worlds. They're predominantly the collection policy is to collect anything to do with European encounters with the North American continent, anything up to around about circa 1800. And so I, I produced, you know, I did a Henry Matisse style paper collage. I started producing a huge mural out of oil pastels and I was bored. I was really, really bored because what I realized I was doing was unlike these little doodles where I was part of this process, you know, these here, these are rapid, I'm just image making again. I'm seeing an image online on the find an aid and I'm replicating it and it is boring. So I had to sort of scrap everything for a time being and I went off and tried to find different resources. So what I did was I ended up looking at the Milner Library, the Circus Allied Arts collections. They got hundreds of photographic prints from the circuses as well worth a look. And I wanted to introduce more rigorous context to my creative practice. So I, I, I just start, started to do this little drawing and I really had in my mind appraisal, the idea that I would create something that was to be disposed of, sort of replicating an archivist behavior. Now this, you can see there's a little tear that occurred in the actual drawing as I was drawing it. It's a terrible drawing, it's a horrible drawing. But then when I ripped it just a little bit, that intrigued me. So then I decided to like, rip it, crunch it up, and I created this object, which was so much more interesting than the drawing. It, it has depth, it has character, there's there's questions to be had with this piece, whereas this image just looked horribly boring. And again, I, I started to think to myself, but let's go back. I, I did an oil pastel sketch of the University of Kentucky, the World Cup basketball. Um, it's very nice, it's very image friendly, very, you know, lots of people gonna like it on Twitter. But then when I was going on the University of Kentucky's archive find an aid, I came across an embedded audio file of Claude Sullivan's commentary. And I started to listen to a basketball game that had first been transmitted in the 1950s. And I, I don't know anything about basketball. I, I really don't. I, I don't come from a a country which has a rich tradition of basketball. But I was really getting very excited and into the game. I started to transcribe the audio as what you find it's a standard practice in all archives. You use trans transcription to enable accessibility to the information. And I started to play with a transcription. I started to layer it on top of one another, merge text together. I took documentation of basketball games to create this collage so the actual words that i was transcribing also matched the images and it, again it was a real breakthrough for me because i was having an authentic experience within my own home and and again i was looking at transcription i transcribed uh, a episode of world war ii's podcast uh, anyone in great britain knows that this image is of london it's of saint paul's it's saint paul survives it's during the London Blitz in 1940. And I replicated it using the transcription that I had done of the podcast episode. And this has so much more soul and depth and authenticity. I am actually having an experience with history, with the information, rather than just listening to something. I'm creating work about my authentic relationship with information, just like Picasso had an authentic relationship. That's why he built Guernica. So I had to really revisit the residency and I really had to start to think, is the problem with the materials I'm using? Am I pushing it enough? Like for instance, like those sketches, I was producing oil pastel drawings from sketches that I produced to create interesting compositions. So what I'm doing at the moment is finding a different way of making those marks using different materials. 
Now I've got quite a lot of this on the go. It's still at the plan and planning stage, but this gets me more excited than these drawings. I've got these sort of crazy like little plans that I've got of like sculptural forms. And I'm thinking, how can I use these objects to create something that's representative of the data? And that's when it sort of clicked with me that I'm actually, I need to focus on the data as a material rather than thinking about what content it holds. Because I'm tripping up on trying to replicate content rather than actually trying to represent my relationship with information, uh, data. And again, I, I took that transcription process and I started to examine what happened if I created a collage. You know, th this is David Rice's uh, lecture. He's an anti-slavery, part of the anti-slavery movement. And, and the actual finding aid with the university's finding aid, uh, you can read all of the text. I think there might even be a transcription available. And when I printed it out over and over and over again, I created these beautiful dark squares that are almost Rothko-esque. It's, it's lost its context, it's lost its information. And yet I have a real strong relationship because I'm using the data in a different way. I'm using the data to make an artwork rather than just simply image making. It, it's something that got me really excited. So I'm actually finally, after quite a while, getting some momentum with the residency and making interesting work. And I've applied sort of the same sort of method with the Utah State Archive. These are all drawings that I've done from prison registers. Now, on the face of it, the, you know, you could say, well, are they good drawings? Are they bad drawings? I don't know, whatever, you know. But what I realized was when I actually put them in a folder and I wrapped archival tape around it and I put some description on the actual folder what I found was that I was starting to have excitement because going back to what I said about Adrian House think about the environment this is why that conference didn't work when I went at conference I put all of my artwork out everywhere anyone could access it I thought that people would look at items and say what's this and I could tell them the story Visually, I know each and every item. I know what, why I made it. I know the origination of the information, why I based it upon a particular archive. But here, the actual records would be accessed by one researcher, and it could be accessed within an archive environment. And having them in a folder means that they're going to get that wow moment, that idea of just flicking through and just pondering and thinking. And I'm really actually being far more authentic to the practice of being an archivist an artist archivist than when i just had everything laid out for people and thinking more now about my environment that i exist within it doesn't matter necessarily if my artwork is quote unquote good quality or not what matters is that it's in context so i i am getting to the end of this presentation um basically Berea College. I'm now based in Kentucky. I'm at Berea College and I've got an art exhibition coming up in April 2022. Now, the purpose of this exhibition is to document what it's like to be an archivist at this institution. And Berea College has the most fantastic history. And these two main points is something that I'm just really fascinated by. The very fact that before the Civil War, this institution was racially integrated, it's co-educational. This That is staggering to think that in the Southern American state, prior the Civil War, th this was occurring. And I was fascinated by how the institution itself took the, took the fact that uh, attacked and protected itself and tried to prevent it from being segregated. It went all the way to the Supreme Court. And there's something here that I really just want to make artwork about. I actually started uh, making a series of items based upon being inspired by that Berea College story. Now, we actually have an Abraham Lincoln special collection here. When I first arrived, I was told that barely anyone actually knew about it, and also not many people have accessed it. So I transcribed the Civil War podcast uh, concerning the Cooper Union address. And the podcast is all about the politics of what 
the politics of America before the outbreak of the Civil War, which again sort of brings me in the context of Berea College, what was happening just before the outbreak of the war. And then I start to layer it over an image of Abraham Lincoln, and I created this item, which I, I don't quite know what to think about yet, but I'm getting excited about this work. And again, I'm having an authentic relationship with the information. And yeah, last two slides, right? I'm, I'm getting to the end of this. Um, at the moment, I'm doing the most intriguing processing of the Appalachian Science sort of Public Interest Collection. Now, this organization, uh, the records predominantly are from the 1970s, 1990s. They're mainly promotional material, photocopies, correspondence, articles. It's lots of evidential values concerning their activity. And we think about the environment and you know green technologies as being a very today issue. Well, actually, this organization was discussing these issues all the way back in the 1970s and they were advocating, they were lobbying for a greener, friendlier, environmental, environmentally friendly world. And I started to again, go back to those drawings that I made documenting the hardware gallery, digital, online digital residency. I started to put these collages together to sort of represent what it is I'm actually witnessing. So I'm taking information, these snippets of information that I see, I'm duplicating them and I'm arranging them within a collage composition. And in turn, I'm creating things that I don't understand. I really don't get this. And I think that's what makes me really excited about this upcoming ex exhibition in April. I'm going to have a lot of work that I simply don't understand, but it's somehow going to link to the Berea archive story and the collections we hold here. And I'd rather be making work which makes me nervous and unable to justify it than say be making picture friendly image making art. So, you know, finally, that, that's basically the snapshot of Artist Archivist. Uh, this is my website. Uh, this has been a wonderful experience to actually talk about art in this way. And it's really started to make me think about I need to rethink how I present my art, how I tell the story of the archive encounter that I have, as well as what artwork I produce. My, my website is just not conducive to telling that story. So I really got to reimagine and rethink what I'm doing here. But if you want to get in contact, if you want any more questions or anything, feel free, just go onto my website and Bob's your uncle, get in touch and well, that, that's basically it. I, I'd like to open the floor up to any questions that anyone has, uh, assuming you're all there. And then um, that's it. Um, thank you very much for listening. Wow, thank you so much. That was really incredible. I'm just going to put back up um, the slide and we can move into the question and answer portion. Um, there's a couple of ways you can either turn on your mic and just ask the question directly. Um, you could leave it in the chat down below, or there's a small activities button, which is um, a triangle, a square, and a circle, and there's a Q&A there. So you can also leave your questions there. But it looks like um, Susan has a question. If you want to go off mute, Susan, feel free to ask a question. Well, I have a question just to start with. How do you fit all of this into your day? I mean, you really have a lot going on. Uh, oh, that's a good question. Um, I, I'm very, I like to keep busy. I, I get bored very, very easily. Uh, it's, it's just natural to me. I, I can't sit down and just uh, do nothing. I just have to do something. It's, yeah. I, Lauren, it is Lauren, yeah. can you hear me now? My question you. was, uh, where you did your artwork? Are you, are you taking some of your art supplies into the archives because the records can't leave? Or are you just using the digital records and painting and drawing from your home 
uh, oh. studio. Well, I can quite literally answer your question by saying, is my pencil case. Uh, I've got, you know, watercolor stuff in here. Of course, the archive material is all protected. I've got a uh, wait that there, got all my pencils. Uh, yeah, I, I do at home. I, I guess I've got a portable studio. Going back to what I said about, I, I do a lot of sketches and I visualize things in sketchbooks. And then when I get back home, that's when I start to produce more refined objects. Okay. Thanks. That's that's what I was wondering because sometimes just the dust from a pastel color would ruin a archival object. Oh yeah, I, I take the preservation of uh, archives extremely seriously. Uh, so I rest assured it's all right. Hmm. Anybody else have any questions for Peter while we have them? Connell, yeah. Uh, not so much a question, but a comment. You, this is really inspiring to me. I, I do queer history of Utah, and I've about three weeks ago I've got this incredible desire, inspiration to do an art piece about Oscar Wilde who came to Utah in 1882. He stayed here for three days and left an indelible print on the city. And, um, you know, like only Oscar Wilde can do. <laughs> and I want to, and I'm, I'm inspired to do a, an art project. In, I'm not an artist. I have a dear friend who's a lesbian who is an amazing artist and photographer. And we've, we're talking about collaborating on a, a piece or a series called Oscar Wilde in Salt Lake City. And going, going to the places where he went, which most of them are now destroyed, but sort of envisioning how he embodied that space when he was here and what he did there and what he took away from that. And um, so just watching your process and, um, and I'm, I'm just like thrilled. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I, I, I love Oscar Wilde's work. Uh, I was, well, I was brought up uh, with Shakespeare and Oscar Wilde, basically. <laughs> That's all he ever taught at school. Uh, yeah, so good luck, and I'll be really intrigued to see what it is you produce, so please keep in contact. I will, yes. And we have a comment here from Melody who said, I really like all of the images that you made. Thank you so much for sharing your talents, which I agree with. Thank you very much. Is there any other questions? Okay, well, luckily we have this recorded, so we will be sharing this, and Peter can share it as well, because this is a really incredible um presentation actually Mahala just wrote this is one of the most fascinating presentations I've ever heard thank you so much for sharing I couldn't agree more so thank you Peter and thank you to everyone for joining us today thank you very much cheerio everyone <laughs>